Welcome to Class Time, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. You can watch this lesson in real time on Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We are also live on GoJamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subject, you can send them in to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or... Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much. For Season watching. greetings. Welcome to class time. Your daily classroom for CSEC and CAVE students. You can watch this lesson in real time on Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We're also live on GoJamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subject, you can send them in to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica or use the hashtag TVJ class time. We, we want to see those questions. Today's lesson is CSEC Maths. I am Brittany Henderson. And I am Latoya Shariah. Today we'll be looking at probability. We want to determine experimental and theoretical probabilities of simple events. But what's probability, Brittany? All right, so probability, I think, tells you how likely something is to happen, right? I think it ranges from zero to one. Somewhere in between there, so it's a fractional number. There's more somewhere there. Right? All right. All right, so zero, a probability that is zero is something that is impossible. So, for example, me being reborn, maybe, you know, the probability of me going back into my mother's womb and being reborn is kind of... Or like, a dog teaching class time or that too all you right know. um an even chance probability what would that look like like half a chance of happening it might happen or it might not happen yeah um seeing that i'm clumsy i'm going to think me falling is that even chance of happening yeah. while walking yeah you yeah. could you, you, it's likely that you could fall or you may, may not, not fall, fall right let's hope um and certain probability certainty we know that Tomorrow, it has to happen. You know that by all. Mm -hmm. I'm going Most. to have a million dollars in my account. Girl, big up yourself. Big up, high five. That, big up yourself. Is that yeah, certain? No? no, no, no. Maybe not. Because that is, you can or you can't. I think that is even chance. I think certainty is, I'm certain that tomorrow is December 15 and tomorrow is a Tuesday. Okay. Million dollars in my account, Tuesday. Works. Girl, keep dreaming. Even chance. <laughs> all right. So, so, as I stated before, a probability can be expressed as a decimal, as a fraction, and even as a percentage. Okay. So, so let us explain this number line again. So, we spoke mm -hmm. about it earlier. Impossible, even chance, and certain. Represented as a decimal, as a fraction, and as a percentage. So, as impossible as a decimal is? Zero. Fraction? Zero. And percentage? Zero percent. All right. Even chance of something happening? Five tenths or 0 0.5. Or as a percentage? Half. Percentage? 50 percent. All right. Certainty. No, I know, I know, I know that this is going to happen. As a decimal? One. As a fraction? One. And as a percentage? 100. So 100 percent that this thing will happen. Definitely. That million dollars in my account. Girl, keep dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we are actually talking a bit now about experimental and theoretical probability. What's the difference between the two? So experimental probability is the actual result of an experiment, as the name states. While theoretical probability is the expected outcome. So you, you, th you have an idea that this will happen, right? Mm -hmm. Both probabilities may differ for a given experiment. And we want to talk about that a little. For example, 
You can conduct an experiment where you flip a coin 100 times. The theoretical probability is 50% head, 50% tails. So you're telling me that there's an even chance of that of me getting a head or a tail because it's two-sided? Two-sided, unless right. you have a three-sided coin, which but I've never heard of. So <laughs> Never right. saw that before. So if you have a coin, you have an even chance of getting the head and an even chance of getting tail. So that's 50-50. However, if uh, you actually conduct the experiment, you may have a case where you have you got 30% heads and 70% tails, which means that both probabilities were different because our theoretical probability was a half for each option. So half head, half tails, because it's one out of two choices that gives us our half. And then for tail, it's one out of two choices. While so our experimental probability gave us three-tenths and, and seven-tenths for the probability. So here we're seeing that the theoretical, meaning what was expected, probability and the experimental probability were actually different. All right. So if you are wondering how it is that we came up with those two numbers, this is how we find theoretic or determine theoretical probability. So your numerator will be the number of favorable outcomes. So in the case of the coin, we were looking at the probability of getting the head. So the favorable outcome there would be one. And then our denominator would be the total number of possible outcomes. Now the coin only has two possible outcomes. And so that's how we got one out of two or a half. Or experimental probability, how do we determine that? So the probability of the event, and in this case, let's say getting the head, would be the number of times an event occurs for the numerator and the denominator, which is the total number of trials. So if I did 10 or the 100, 100 um, trials, my number of times the event occurred would have been 30. And then the total number of trials would have been 100. And so the probability of getting the head would have been 3 tenths or 30 hundredths. Nice. All right. But All right. what better way to determine these kinds of probability rather than doing the experiment? Yeah, so let's, let's get into action. So All we're right. going to carry out a few experiments now to determine the experimental probability and see how that checks out when we look at theory. So we're going to look at what theoretically is supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to carry out a series of experiments and see exactly what we're going to get, right? All if right. you guys are already at home, you can get your deck of cards, you can get your little um, dice. dice, you can get and some cups and come do the experiments with us. with us. Right. And you can tell us on Facebook using the hashtag TVJ class time yes. and let us know how your experiment worked out. All right. So first, we are going to be using our cards. So we want to find out what is the probability of getting a heart from a deck of cards. And we know that the, there are quite a number of hearts mm -hmm. in a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to know which particular heart. It's not heart of, di heart of diamonds. <laughs> not heart of ten of hearts, but any heart. Just a heart. Right? Just yeah. a heart. And so the first thing we want to do is to determine our theoretical probability before we do our experiment, to determine our experimental probability. Now, as we stated, you can determine the theoretical probability by numerator would be the number of favorable outcomes. So want to get a heart from a deck of cards. Brittany, how much favorable outcomes do we have there? All right. So in this case, in the deck of cards, I think we have 13 hearts. All right. Let's go and start from ace. Ace, two, three. Girl, we have four suits. Don't. We have oh. spade, diamond, hearts, Clubs. and hearts, right? Right, Four. right. And the card, have, the card deck have what? 52, right? 52. Mm -hmm. All right. And you said no. All right. Ace and, all right, go. Ace, queen, jack, king, ace, queen, jack, king. Mm -hmm. 
Let's start. 10, 9, 8, eight. 7, 6, 5, 4. All right, three. you use your 10 Two. fingers, I use my. All right. Come again. All right, come All right. again. Ace, mm -hmm. Queen, mm -hmm. Jack, mm -hmm. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, four mm -hmm. 3, 2, and you never say king. All right. oh. 13. Oh, yes. Okay. 13. So, so we have 13 hearts. All right. So All right. that means that our numerator would be 13. And then the total number of cards, which is the total possible outcome, is would 52. be 52. Because there are 52 cards in the deck. All, All right. right. Excluding the jokers, that is. So this deck does not include our jokers. And if we were to simplify 13, 50 second, we would get one fourth. And so the probability of getting a heart or any of the other suits is one fourth. And we are going to do some tries and see what the um, experimental probability would be so here are the instructions at home so get your cards get mommy get daddy get your sister get grandma and try this experiment right so you're going to draw a card from the deck record the suit and put the card back in the deck you have to put the card back in the deck because if you don't put back the card then you're now changing the total number of possible outcomes right Brittany? yes and you want to continue until you have drawn and replaced four cards. So, all right, so Brittany is going to record. I'm going to shuffle. I'm going to shuffle. I wonder if one of our cameramen wants to come and draw. <laughs> Clive, you want to come and draw a card? <laughs> all right, come on, Brittany. So you're going to take one card. What, what one? I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> okay. All right, and you have get a I got a diamond. a diamond. Okay, so you're going to record your diamond. So we got one diamond so far. Shuffle. All right. Pull another one. Okay, better. Oh, no, you're not shuffling I'm the card, I'm a magician. Girl. Same diamond. <laughs> or maybe you mark the card in a Britney. All right, ready. So that's two out of four draws. Big money, big money. I want big a heart. Big money, all right. Mm -hmm. It's a heart we want, don't you? Right. All right, let me come to the front. Maybe you know the heart is closer to the... Oh, I oh. got a heart. <laughs> all right, so that's one heart. One more draw. Okay, all right. Here we go, ready. Okay. Heart. I, again, money. I'm coming. I'm coming to the front because you know. Big money. Oh Lord, guys. <laughs> Five of clubs. I, I, I got a. All oh. right. <laughs> okay. So let's let's see what our experimental probability is. So we had four draws, and based on the recording on the board, I'm seeing here where we have heart to be one fourth. Diamond to be two fourths, and we can simplify that to a half, and then we have clubs one fourth. Now, based on our theoretical probability, we knew that we had one fourth of a chance of get getting each suit, but in actuality. Let's see what we have here. So we, heart was one fourth. So our experiment is actually matching to our theoretical there for hearts. Mm -hmm. Diamond, that was a half or two fourths. But for the theoretical, it was one fourth. So that's a little bit different. And for clubs, it was one fourth, which is in keeping with, with our theoretical. So as stated before, they may differ. All right, so we are going to take a break and we will be right back. Stay tuned.
Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome back. This is CSET Mathematics and we're discussing probability. So right before the break, we looked at um, a deck of cards and we carried out a few ex uh, one experiment with the deck of cards. So we looked at what suit we could get. We wanted to get the hearts from a deck of cards which has 52 cards and we were looking at the likelihood or the chance of pulling a heart from that deck. Right? Yes. So what was our theoretical probability Latoya? Okay so the theoretical probability of getting any suit from the entire deck was one fourth because okay. there are four options and to get one suit that would be one fourth okay and what was the probability of what was our experimental probability so what were the outcomes from our little experiment that we carried out all right so from our experiment if i can remember correctly we got one fourth for hearts two fourths for diamond, one fourth for club, and we didn't get any spade, which clearly shows that sometimes your experimental probability may differ from your theoretical probability. Yes. And so we're going to conduct another, another experiment with the cards. Now, what I've done is to separate each the suits, and I have clubs in my hand. And now I want you I want to see how good you are, Brittany. I want to see if you can get the ace of spade. So first we want to determine now what is the theoretical probability of getting the ace of spade. We say that, which is represented as a fraction in this case. 
and our numerator will be the favorable outcome, the number of favorable outcome. Okay. How many how many aces there in ace of spade? One? One. One. Right. Okay. One. And then the total number of possible outcomes for the suit of spades. Thirteen spades in a in a deck, don't? Yes. Okay, okay. Thirteen. So that's one thirteenth. One thirteenth. Yes. Right? All right. So let's see. Okay. So I wanted to put other as the other option. And I'm going to give you three tries. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you three tries. And we're going to see if you can get Ace of Spades. Let's go. Okay, so I'm going to start from the top and then I'm going to go in the middle. Okay, top. Let's see. Mm, that was a fail. So I got... <laughs> Um, six of clubs. Six of clubs. So that's one for spade. other. Oh, my bad. Six, <laughs> six of, of spade. spade. I'm sorry. All right. Remember, you can try at home and tag TVJ on Instagram and let us know what was your experiment like. All right. All right. Let me go to the middle now. Yeah. Yeah. Middle eight. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. Okay. Guys. <laughs> Nine of nine of spades. What is going nine. on? No, I don't understand. I don't think gambling is in your future. It's not. <laughs> All right, final try. I would like, you know, the ace of spade. Ace of spade. All right, final try. Let's go. Ace of spade. Uh, I got it. <laughs> ace of spade. So. All right. Third time's the charm. Third time's the charm. Here you go. All right. So of, what is our results telling us, Brittany? Um, so the experimental probability, so we got ace of spade just one time, so that's one thirteenth. Mm -hmm. And we got other spades twice. <laughs> <laughs> so that would have been two of 13. And so, it, it looks like it's adding up here, <laughs> right? So the probability of me actually getting, theoretically, an ace of spade was 1 13th. Based on my experiment, it is still 1, ter one 13th, right? Um, however, we also got other twice before that, which is 2 13th, which if we look at the theory... And there were two different numbers too. There were two different numbers, right. yes. So if we were pulling those numbers, then the yeah. probability would still lie. Because to get yes. any of the number in the suit would have, would have been 1 13th. Right. So this is this experiment kind of, you know. All be. right. I want to give you one more try. And I'm going to put back all the cards together. And I want to know, see if you can still get the ace of spade. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. But would our, the would our theoretical probability now change? Hmm. Now we have how many cards again? We have... Um, so I'm, I now have the entire pack. So that's 52. Right. So we have 52 cards. And there are... What's it, what did you ask me for again? Ace of spades? Yes. There's still only one ace of spades though. Right. Oh boy. One out of 52 cards. But I have a question. Do you have a, a greater chance or a lesser chance of getting the Ace of Spade? Well, if before I had 13 cards and it took me three tries, I know I have 52 cards. Guys, what do you think at home? <laughs> I think my chance kind of kind of look darkish. <laughs> darkish. Darkish. Okay. All right, let's try. All right, let's go. How many times are you going to give me? How many tries do you want? I'd like three because it seems to be the charm for me. The okay. third one? Okay. All right. No problem. All right. Let's try. So our theoretical probability is, is one. one out of 52. And I got an other. So I got nine of, nine of spades. Okay. All right. Oh, my bad. Put it Sorry. back. Remember, you have to put it back. All right. Try number two. Okay, let's go for the top, top, top. I tell you, what's your name of the cards? <laughs> what? Guys, nine of spades again. What's going on? 
Here you go. All right. Final try. Big money. Uh, I mean, let's even <laughs> if that can help me now. All right. Here we go. All right. Let's try it on the back. Oh, no. Okay, guys. <laughs> So the nines are working for me, so I can pull a nine. I have nine of nine of diamonds here, but still no ace of no spade. ace of spade. What's going on? Here you go. So that means that our experimental probability in this case is it matching to our theoretical probability? Well, in this case, no, you know, no. And that's fine because sometimes your Theoretical probability won't match your experimental probability. And that's the point we want to drive home. So ensure if you are doing your experiment at home and you can do your experiment with anything, you can get a bag of snacks, ask somebody to pull from the bag and determine the theoretical and experimental probability and share it with us on Facebook or Instagram. All right, so experiment number two, we're going to be using a die, one die. And we want to find out what is the probability of getting a one when you roll an unbiased die. So I didn't pad up any particular side of the die. It's a very fair die. So I have a fair chance of getting any of the six faces when I roll this die. And the first thing we want to determine is our theoretical probability. All right. And what is that? All right, so you just said it. We have our die here has six faces. So the total number of possible outcomes is six and the number of favorable outcomes. So in this case, I want to get a one. So that's really just one. So in this case, that's one sixth. Mm -hmm. So my theoretical probability of getting a one when, or of Latoya getting a one when she <laughs> rolls the die, it's one okay. sixth. All right. And by that, we can also see that the theoretical probability of getting any of the faces, any of the numbers, would be one sixth. So I have a fair chance of getting any of the numbers on the die. All right. So true. here we go. Roll away. Get your die at home and try. Wow. Oh. Three. So I'm going to give myself six tries. Okay. Four. Still have four more chances. Don't feel, oh, one. All right, I have three more. Six. Oh. Four. One. How many tries is that? That's six now. Yes. All right. So of six rolls, what is our theoretical probability? Oh, experimental probability, sorry. All right, so for the outcome, which is one, which is really what we wanted to get, we got one twice for the six rolls. So it would have been two sixths. We got two, no time at all, that's zero. We got three once. We got four twice and we got five not one time and six just once. So right. let us look at the comparison between the experiment that we carried out and what it says theoretically that we should have gotten. So here on your screens, you'll see the theory. So theoretically, for each one of the outcomes, we should have gotten one sixth theoretical probability, right? And in this particular case, we're looking at the outcome of getting a one and Boy, and them look like them kind of differ here. So it is actually experimentally we got two sixths and theoretically we would have gotten one sixth chance of getting a one. Right, Latoya? Yes. So we're seeing almost everything, a few things adding up and a few things a little bit different. Huh? Only the three and the six matched theoretically. The one, two, four and five were different and that's fine. We just want you to understand that there is a theory and when you experiment, the theory might differ from the experiment, right? That All is right. correct. Brittany, mm -hmm. I want to see now what is my chance of getting an even number. 
when even I rolled Even number? It yes, man, even number. So, what are even numbers again? Numbers that are divisible by two without leaving a remainder. All right. So, even numbers. All right, let's yes. go, guys. So, at home, our even numbers would be what? Two, four, and six. So, based on this die, those are the only even numbers that we have. Two, four, and six. So, we're looking at the likelihood of getting a two, a four, or a six. Right? Yes. All right. Awesome. Guys, I hope you have your die out, you know. I hope you're doing this with us. Right? All right. So, what is our theoretical probability, Latoya? Of getting a two, four, or a six. All right. So there are three even numbers, mm -hmm. and there are six options. True. So that's three sixths. It looks kind of like one third. Th one half. Three <laughs> six a half. <laughs> so it looks like a half. All right. Hold on a little bit. You know. Let's erase this real fast. All right, good. We're ready again. All, All right, right, so Latoya is going to go ahead and carry out this experiment again. Guys, get out a die and roll with us. Not close die, no, you know. <laughs> this die, right? All right. Six. Awesome. So how many, how many rolls should I do? Do six again, no? Do okay. six again. All right. Good. One. Okay. Ooh, three. Four. One. How many is that? Five? One mm -hmm. more? One more. Six. All right, so guys, here we have our theoretical probability, which was three sixths or a half. Mm -hmm. Now let's check and see if the experiment matches up to what it, we said theoretically. All right, let's are you ready? Yes. All right, so we got a one how many times? Two times. Twice, so it's two sixths. We didn't get any twos this time, mm -hmm. so we got three and four just one time, so that's one sixth each. And we got six. Two times. Two times. No five. No five. No. What were we trying to do again? Get an even number. Let us look at the theory and what it is here. Mm -hmm. So, so the theory is three six, and based on this table, is that so? How many even numbers did we get? I'm seeing. We got three six. Yes. So we got. The, the theoretical probability is indeed matching up with the experimental probability. But I have a question, Brittany. From the experiment we did just now, what's the theoretical probability of getting a prime number? Oh, Lord. First, she took me to even numbers. <laughs> now she's gone to prime numbers. Come on, math is continuous and it's all... Together, it's going to come together. It's not different. All right, let's talk. Yeah, remind man. me again. What are prime numbers? So a prime on. number has only two factors, mm -hmm. one and itself. All right, so from this, let us see. Two, yes. Mm -hmm. Two, um, five. Five. Mm -hmm. um, three. Three. Uh, that's it, notes. Right. So two, five, and three. Right. All right. So that means that our probability for getting an... A prime a number. A prime number is the same as getting an even number. It looks like that, you know. All right. So let's see then from our experiment if the experimental probability and the theoretical probability is the same or different. So how many of the prime numbers did we get and what's that fraction? Well, guys, based on our experiment, you check it with me. I didn't get any twos, right? I got three once, and I got no fives. So from this experiment, it's mm -hmm. one six. And you said that theoretically it should be three, three six. six. Um, so in this case, guys, it didn't add up. So the experimental and theoretical probabilities differed. And again, let's emphasize that. It's okay if it's not the same, yes. okay? All right. All right. Here's the fun activity now. 
And I want us both to do this one. Oh, Lord. So we're going to do a cup flipping activity. You know that drinking game, but we're not drinking. No, we're not promoting that. None at all. All right. So this is what we're going to do. We want to know what is the probability of the cup landing on bottom up. So we want the base of the cup to be upward. So first we have to determine what are the possible outcomes when we flip a cup. All right, so it can land on the base. The base. It can land on the top. The top, the opening. And it can land on the side too, don't On the side, okay. right. And we want to know what's the probability of it landing base up, bottom up. One, 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 one out of three possible outcomes. Yes. All right, one, one third. third. And by nature of that, we the probability of get the cup landing on any of the options there would be one third. Yes, that would be correct. All right, so we're gonna do six times. I'll do three, and you do three. Okay, that can work. Because, okay. You know? <laughs> and so one, one, I go, then you go. Okay. All right, so. Here we go. And get your, don't use your mother glass cup, you know. Use the plastic ones. Right? So I'm going to flip and let's see. Okay, go flip away. Oh! Proud of myself. All right, your turn. Oh, <laughs> all right. Let's okay, see. Okay, let's try this. Guys, don't laugh after me if it don't really work, you know? All right. Side. Side. Come on. <laughs> I'm not going to boast and say I'm a winner or anything. I'm just <coughs> you just get what <coughs> lucky flip. Look at that. Ugh. You see, that's why I must not be boastful. Yes. All right. All right, all right, all right. Come, guys. Hope. Oh, Lord. Side. This side seems to be my favorite thing to, to land on. All right. My time. Okay. All right. All right, and it's me again. Let's go. Okay, cup. Let me even clear the way. Ready? Let's. It does that really count though? It counts. The computer is in the way. It counts, it, guys. It, it, it counts. Look at that. It's it's actually. I don't think that. I don't. Fine. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I get a little. Mm. Like a shine. Yes. I think we should go three more times. I'm, I'm going to win. Ready, let's go. My turn, ready. Okay. This cup, though. La -da -dee. Let me even put it down here, guys, because I don't want anything to obstruct my flipping. Ah! Oh, my days! I, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like this. I really don't like this. Okay. I don't like this. So. Okay, my last time. My last one. Again, nothing to obstruct. Okay, ready? All right, CTR now. Winnings. Winnings. Okay. Okay. How many times would we have gone in total? Nine? Oh, oh. <laughs> I think I'm you're sorry, supposed guys. to go one more. No, I'm supposed Is that to go. Two, four, six, eight. Yeah, one more, 12. Okay. All right, guys. One more try. Let's see. Look at, I have the, I have the magic touch. Look at that. Oh my goodness. Okay, fine. I Let's like determine that. the probability. Shout out to Jordan. Good job. Gaming on YouTube, who is participating. Okay. Go, Jordan. We see you. We see you, boo. Okay. See, Jordan, Jordan. <laughs> you're like me, right? You're getting it. You're getting it. Good job, All Jordan. Right. So if you're participating at home, don't forget. Hashtag us. Tag us if you have any questions also, please to post them. Mm -hmm. We will see them and answer them as best as we can. All right? 
Shout out to you, Jordan. Pick up yourself. All right, so we did 12 tries. So let's see. All right, so for landing on the base, mm -hmm. we got five twelfths. Mm -hmm. For landing on the side, for the cup landing on the side, we got seven twelfths. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that time I forget what the question was. <laughs> What's the probability, theoretical, the probability of landing on the, the base up? Base up. Okay, so no, we did it. We, 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 did, we flipped our cups 12 times. Right. So the probability of landing base up out of 12 flips would have been what? One fourth. Okay. And this is for 12. Right. For 12 flips. Right? Because we have 12 flips and you should have an even number of getting... The cup landing on any of the sides. Three top. sides. Right. Good. So uh, from the 12 flips divided by three, then we'll get four. So it would be. All right. So let's look at our table, guys. Our table for getting, for landing on the base was five mm -hmm. twelfths. Base up. Base up. Um, top up. Top up. That's right. Top mm -hmm. up <laughs> was zero. Right. Um, landing on the side was seven twelfths, right? Right. So based on this is our theoretical probability matching back to our experimental probability nope but is that a problem nope so sometimes that happens so there are times when your theoretical probability will not match up to your experimental probability so guys if you tried the experiment at home with us Thank you very much. I hope you had fun. I had fun. I never knew I could flip a cup, and I'm happy. I was flipping. <laughs> All right. So just to quickly recap, exper experimental probability is the actual result of an experiment, while theoretical probability is the expected outcome. Probability lies from 0 to 1. All right, guys? If you want more maths, mathematics, you can go to School Time Math on One Spot Media. And if you have any questions and what we've done today, send them in to our various platforms and we will be more than happy to answer them for you. Until next time, I am Latoya Shariah. And I am Brittany Henderson. Coming up next is C-Sex Spanish. Adios. Bye guys. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on OneSpotMedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome back to Class Time, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. Today, we'll be discussing CSEC Spanish, and our topic is Como celebraremos la Navidad. I am Kevin Edwards. Muy buenos días, estudiantes. Sean todos bienvenidos al Español es Divertido. Mi nombre es Yasmin. Y trabajo en San Joseph Teachers College. Entonces. Muy bien. So, la clase de hoy es, el tema de la clase de hoy es Home and Family. Sí. Y, our topic is, ¿Cómo celebraremos la Navidad? Muy bien. ¿Cómo celebraremos la Navidad? Ok, no. Vamos a ver los objetivos de la clase. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to make plans for the Christmas holidays, ask and answer questions correctly about upcoming events using the simple future tense, make comparisons of Christmas celebrations between Jamaica and Spanish-speaking countries. Okay. Now, estudiantes, observa la conversación y dinos cuáles son los planes de Kevon y la familia de Yasmin. Now, students, you are going to observe a conversation and you are going to tell us what are Kevon's plan and Yasmin's family's plan. Entonces, vamos a comenzar. Okay. Hola. Hola, Jasmine. Qué bon, ¿cómo estás? Estoy muy bien, gracias. ¿Y tú? Muy bien, muy bien. ¿Dónde estabas? Hace tiempo que no te veía. Estaba en el campo. Oh, a propósito. ¿Qué harás en esta Navidad? Te voy a hacer una invitación. Mis primos llegaron de Colombia y quiero que los conozcas. Te espero que me acepte la invitación. Bueno, yo visitaré a mi familia en Kingston. Con es, esta pandemia no hay mucho que hacer. Ok, ¿y qué más harás? Pues, mi familia y yo Compartiremos con otras amistades en casa. ¿Y tú? Me quedaré en casa. 
Además, soy muy hogareña y con esta pandemia no se puede salir a la calle. Entonces, mi familia y yo nos repartiremos los quehaceres. Mis hermanas comprarán la comida en el mercado. Mi hermano limpiará la cocina y yo cocinaré el lechón. Entonces, ¿y tus primos qué harán? Mis primos organizarán la casa, decorarán y cantarán villancicos en la casa también. Sí, entonces, tengo que irme. Ok, adiós. Adiós. Ok, adiós, un abrazo. So, entonces, now, Observa la conversación otra vez y dinos cuáles son las actividades que cada persona hará durante la Navidad. Now, students, you are going to observe the conversation and you're going to tell us what are the activities that each person will be doing for Christmas. Entonces... Ok. Hola, Kevon. Hola, Jasmine. ¿Cómo estás? Hace tiempo que no te veías. Estoy muy bien, gracias. ¿Y ¿Qué tú? hará? Muy bien, muy bien. ¿Qué hará en la Navidad? Pues, en la Navidad, yo visitaré, yo visitaré a mi familia. ¿Y tú? Me quedaré. En casa. Bueno. Pues mi familia y yo compartiremos en casa con otras amistades. ¿Y tú? Mi familia y yo repartiremos los quehaceres. Bueno. ¿Y tú qué van? Pues mis hermanas comprarán la comida en el mercado. Muy bien. ¿Y tú? Mi hermano limpiará la cocina. ¿Y tú qué van? Pues yo cocinaré el lechón. ¿Y tú? Mis primos, ellos organizarán la mesa. También decorarán la casa y también ellos cantarán villancicos en casa. Entonces, profesora, ¿qué es villancicos? Villancicos también a uh, carol songs en, oh. es, en inglés, ¿sí? Carol Christmas song. carols, muy bien. Sí, muy bien. So, now, estudiantes... ¿De qué hablan los profesores? ¿De qué hablan los profesores? No, students, what, what the teachers um, were talking about. Ok, can you tell us, students? Vamos a ver. Vamos a ver. So, ¿cuáles son las actividades que cada persona hará durante la Navidad? So you were talk, we were talking in a dialogue, so now you're going to be willing to say us cuáles son las actividades que cada persona hará durante la Navidad. Okay, what are the activities that each person will be doing for Christmas? So, did you get that one? Muy bien, yo visitaré a mi familia. Repitan ustedes, por favor. Yo visitaré a mi familia. Muy bien. Vamos a ver. Me quedaré en casa. Me quedaré en casa. Make sure you get that one. Bueno, continuamos. Vamos a ver qué van. Sí, mi familia y yo Compartiremos en casa con otras amistades. Una vez más, 
mi familia y yo compartiremos en casa con otras amistades. Muy bien. Mi familia y yo nos repartiremos los quehaceres. Una vez más, mi familia y yo nos repartiremos los quehaceres. Bueno, vamos a continuar. Mis hermanas comprar, comprarán la comida en el mercado. Repitan. Mis hermanas comprarán la comida en el mercado. Muy bien. Muy bien, estudiantes. Mi hermano limpiará la cocina. Did you get that one? Mi hermano limpiará la cocina. Muy bien. Continuamos. Yo cocinaré el lechón. Okay. Repitan. Yo cocinaré el lechón. Muy bien. Mis primas organizarán la mesa. Mis primas organizarán la mesa. Perfecto, estudiantes. Continuamos. Ellos decorarán la casa. Ellos decorarán la casa. Continuamos. Ellos también cantarán villancicos en casa. Uh -huh. Repitan. Cantarán villancicos en casa. Now, students, do you remember what villancicos is? Muy bien. Christmas carols. Christmas carols. Muy bien. Bueno. So now, what do you notice about what we say what someone will do? Hmm. What do you notice about that? Entonces, vamos a ver. Yo visitaré a mi familia. Mm -hmm. bueno. Yo visitaré a mi familia. So, let's see. Continuamos. Mm -hmm. Mi hermano limpiará la cocina. Mi hermano limpiará la cocina. What do you notice, students? What do you notice en limpiará? Mm, limpiará. So, vamos, a, vamos ver. a ver. Ellos cantarán villancicos en casa. Ellos cantarán villancicos en casa. Bueno. Muy bien. Continuamos. All right. What do you notice about the ending of the verbs? Hmm? What do you notice about the ending of the verbs? Right? You have yo visitare. Yo visitare. Sorry. Yo visitare a mi familia. So, if you notice, you have all the verb here. Visitar. What does visitar mean? ¿Qué significa visitar? Visitar means to visit. Muy bien. Bueno. So, the verb is correct, visitar. So, now, yeah, we're going to listen a song soon. So, you will know how to, Con. how the verb of future tense work. Bueno. With. All right. Entonces, nosotros vamos a cantar juntos. Bueno, después de tres, 
Uno, dos y tres. El futuro simple es fácil de conjugar. Conjugar. El futuro simple es muy fácil de conjugar. Conjugar. Solo, Solo tienes, tienes que agregar. E, as, a, en la forma de plural. Hemos an. Muy bien. Ay, Dios mío. Entonces. Muy bien. So now. Right? You notice, solo tienes que agregar. What does agregar mean? Hmm? Hmm. What does agregar mean? So you have simple future tense. It's very easy to conjugate. The only thing that you have to do is to add. To add the ending. E, as, a, emos, an. ¿Qué carbón? Sí. For example. Yo visitaré a mi familia. Right, yo visitaré a mi familia. So, entonces, estudiantes, ¿qué harás en esta Navidad? ¿Qué harás, ¿Qué harás en esta Navidad? Entonces, uh, profesora Jasmine, ¿Sí? ¿qué harás en esta Navidad? Yo me quedaré en casa. Bueno. Uh -huh. Me quedaré en casa porque con esta pandemia no se puede. ¿Y tú? Pues yo visitaré a mi familia en Kingston. Muy bien. Porque so, con esta pandemia no hay mucho que hacer. Perfecto. Entonces, continuamos. Ok. Now, ahora estudiantes, vamos a leer y a escribir. Vamos a leer y a escribir. Bueno. Miguel writes to his friend Anita in the Dominican Republic, telling her of his plans for the Christmas holidays. Bien. First, we're going to see the questions. Before we go through with the letter, con la carta, We're going to see the questions, right? The, you can take a picture. Sí. Yes, Kevon? Sí, ustedes pueden sacar una foto. Muy bien. So, las preguntas son, ¿Quién comprará los alimentos? ¿Quién comprará los alimentos? Número dos. Número dos, ¿Qué hará? La mamá de Miguel, ¿qué hará la mamá de Miguel? Menciona las actividades que harán las hermanas de Miguel. Menciona las actividades que harán las hermanas de Miguel. ¿Qué hará Miguel? ¿Qué hará Miguel? What question does Miguel ask at the end? What question does Miguel ask at the end? Bien, ahora vamos a leer la carta. Hola, Anita. Te voy a contar cómo mi familia y yo pasaremos la Navidad en esta pandemia. Lo primero que haremos es ponernos en oración. Luego, mi madre se encargará de darnos las actividades del día. Mi hermano mayor comprará los alimentos. Por supuesto, mi madre se encargará de la cocina y organizará la casa, pero mis hermanas decorarán la mesa y el arbolito de Navidad. Después, nos sentaremos en la mesa, comeremos, beberemos la bebida famosa de Jamaica, Sorrel, y al final, yo recogeré todo. ¿Y tú? ¿Qué actividades harás? Espero ansiosamente tu respuesta. Miguel. Bien. Vamos a leer la carta una vez más. Going to read the letter one more time. ¿Ok? Hola, Anita. 
te voy a contar cómo mi familia y yo pasaremos la Navidad en esta pandemia. Lo primero que haremos es ponernos en oración. Luego, mi madre se encargará de darnos las actividades del día. Mi hermano mayor comprará los alimentos. Por supuesto, mi madre se encargará de la cocina y organizará la casa. Pero mis hermanas decorarán la mesa y el arbolito de Navidad. Después nos sentaremos en la mesa, comeremos, beberemos la bebida famosa de Jamaica, Sorrel, y al final yo recogeré todo. ¿Y tú? ¿Qué actividades harás? Espero ansiosamente tu respuesta. Miguel. Entonces, en este momento, vamos a responder las preguntas. So, students, you are now going to respond to the questions. ¿Están preparados? Vamos a ver. So, let's see if you got them correct. Ok, número uno. ¿Quién comprará los alimentos? El hermano de Miguel comprará los alimentos. Did you get the answer? Muy bien. Excelente. ¿Qué hará la mamá de Miguel? La madre de Miguel organizará y se encargará de la cocina. Muy bien. Menciona las actividades que harán las hermanas de Miguel. Muy bien. Ellas decorarán la mesa y el arbolito de Navidad. ¿Qué hará Miguel? So, Miguel recogerá todo. Muy bien, estudiantes. What question does Miguel ask at the end? Muy bien. ¿Y tú qué harás? Perfecto, estudiantes. Okay. So now you're going to answer the question number number five. Mm, number cinco. What question does Miguel ask at the end? Quiero escucharlos. ¿Y tú qué harás? ¿Y tú qué harás? Muy bien. Entonces, continuamos. Entonces, vamos a practicar más. Listening Comprehension, Section 1. Instructions. For each question in this section, you will hear a single sentence. Choose from the four pictures in your test booklet the one picture which shows what the sentence says. Then, shade the corresponding space on the answer sheet. For example, you hear, El muchacho comerá la cena de Navidad. Now we are going to begin to look at the picture for 15 seconds. Time to stop. So the correct answer is the third picture. So you would say, you would shade the space with the letter C on the answer sheet. Okay, students? Entonces, vamos a comenzar. Mi hermana... Lavará los platos después de la cena de Navidad. Q. 
question 2. Mis amigos y yo beberemos sorrel. Question 3. Mi prima visitará a la familia en el campo. Número 4. Este fin de semana escucharé villancicos. Número 5. Número 5. Tú leerás la ca las cartas de Navidad. Tú leerás las cartas de Navidad. Número 6. La niña comerá pastel de fruta. La niña comerá pastel de fruta. Número 7. Mis primos cantarán en esta Navidad. Mis primos cantarán en esta Navidad. Número 8. ¿Quién cocinará el lechón? ¿Quién cocinará el lechón? Ok. Now let's see the sentences. Mi hermana lavará los platos después de la cena de Navidad. Mi amiga y yo beberemos sorel. Mi prima visitará a la familia en el campo. Este fin de semana escucharé viancicos. Tú leerás las cartas de Navidad. La niña comerá pastel de fruta. Mis primos cantarán en esta Navidad. ¿Quién cocinará el lechón? Let's see the answer now. Mi hermana lavará los platos después de la cena de Navidad. Now, students, what guide you to select A for your response? What did you hear? Is it hermana? Is it los platos? Muy bien. Okay. Mi amiga y yo beberemos sorrel. Mi amiga y yo beberemos sorrel. Now, but, students, what, why you chose B for your response? What guide you for selecting B? Is it the term sorrel? Is it mi amiga y yo? Muy bien. Continuamos. Mi prima visitará a la familia en el campo. Mi prima visitará a la familia en el campo. Bueno, y la respuesta es A. All right. Sí. Este fin de semana escucharé Villancicos. 
Sí. What is the answer for that one, Kevon? Pues, let's Escuchare. see what the students. Let's see what the students chose. What? Se. Entonces, what was the key word that guided the students? What do you think, Professora, that guided the students to choose C? Escucharé. They are, you see, they are listening music here. So this weekend, the ladies listen the Villancicos music. Hmm? Muy bien. So listen is the verb. Bueno. Sí, continuamos. Tú leerás las cartas de Navidad. Tú leerás las cartas de Navidad. Sí. Y la respuesta es A. Muy bien, estudiantes. La niña comerá pastel de fruta. La niña comerá pastel de fruta. Right. What guide you to use to answer B? Hmm? La niña is a girl and she eating a uh, pastel cake. Huh? So this is the answer. Bueno. Yes. Letter B. ¿Quién cocinará el lechón? So what guide you for the answer? Lechón. Hmm? ¿Quién cocinará el lechón? So lechón is a pig. So D is the answer. Muy bien. Entonces, en este momento, vamos a jugar. Vamos a jugar la sí. ruleta animada, ¿verdad que sí, Kevon? Sí, muy bien. Sí, muy bien. So, voy a explicar el juego. Mm -hmm. Now, students, you are going to, we are going to play a game, right? And you are going to spin the wheel, okay? And wherever it stops, you are going to tell us what each person will do. Okay, students? You are going to tell us what each person will do. Muy importante. Right. Entonces. For example. Oh. Lo siento. Lo siento. We're going to spin. We should spin, okay. right? And then, oh. Y entonces. Okay, so. Okay, let's so see. No. We have, uh, it goes on this one. Mi hermana celebrar, por ejemplo. So we, we could say, students, mi hermana celebrará. La Navidad en el campo. Right. Okay. Suppose that I pin, I spin the, the, la ruleta and I stop in yo uh -huh. beber, right? Yo beber. So you will see, all right, using mm -hmm. the future tense, you will see yo beberé sorel. Muy bien. Muy bien. Yo beberé sorel. All right. Sí. Another one, Kevon. On this one, mi madre y yo, could be mi madre y yo, cantaremos biancicos en la iglesia. Right. Muy bien. Cantaremos. All right. Supposed to get that one. Mm? Mis primas escribir. So, mis primas Escribirán las cartas, right? Bueno. So now, supuesto de spin and it coming to sabías. So sabías? Uh -huh. Right. Sabías, this is a culture, a uh, uh, Christmas culture of la América del Sur, right? La noche vieja. Se celebra el 31 de diciembre. Hay muchos fuegos artificiales y la gente cree en supersticiones. Por ejemplo, la gente come 12 uvas para tener buena suerte en el año nuevo. 
right? Okay, so uh, on the 31st of December, they, you know, have a lot of um, artificials, um, fires, and a lot of superstitions and eating 12 grapes. Right, wow. yes, people eating 12 grapes for the lucky, to be a lucky, all right, for the new year. So the next one now, Grand Market y la Noche Buena. Hmm? La Navidad es diferente en los países hispanos, pero también hay semejanzas con la cultura de Jamaica. Okay. So Christmas is different in Hispanic countries, right? But also there are similarities with the, cult with the Jamaican culture. Okay. México y Centroamérica. México y Centroamérica. Se celebran las posadas. La gente canta villancicos. Christmas son. Right. Y al final rompen una pi piñata. Right. Do you know what is piñata? Okay. Okay. Right what here. is piñata? Okay, yes. Then fill a piñata with sweeties. Right. Now, students, these were some of the possible um, responses, right? Right, remember you can use your own response, that's all what we did, right? Right. Yo beberé jugo de manzana. Uh -huh. Mi madre yo contaremos, tú compartirás, tú y Miguel decorarán, mi hermana celebrará y mis primas escribirán. Muy bien. Right. So, by the way, Kevon, do you know, um, can you tell me something about the culture in Jamaica with Christmas? Pues, we, we have Grand Market, right, which is a Jamaican um, celebration, okay? So, that's something that is um, unique to Jamaica, where the Jamaican citizens would um, go out on the eve of Christmas, which we call the um, Grand Market. Okay. So, continuamos con la clase, yeah? Okay, muy bien. So, we have now rap song, okay. songs, questions. Okay. Un momento, por favor. Okay. Okay, so these are some situations, um, students. Can have a look at them. Right. Okay. So tell us two things. So you remember you're going to use the future tense, right? Tell okay. us two things that your cousin will do to celebrate Christmas. All right. So, um, estudiantes, ¿qué aprendiste hoy? ¿Qué aprendiste hoy? So we made plans for the Christmas holidays. Right, me quedaré en casa, mi familia yo compartiremos en casa con otras amistades, muy bien. So we learned how to make plans for the Christmas holiday and ask and answer questions correctly about upcoming events. Right, ¿qué harás en esta Navidad? So now for the homework, students. So you are going to write a letter to a new friend from Colombia Right? Tell him or her what you are planning to do or to celebrate Christmas during the pandemic. And you must include when and where you and your family will celebrate Christmas, who, will invite, who you will invite for this celebration, what your mother will prepare for dinner, and three things that your siblings will do. So students, you can take a photograph of, this, um, of these points to include in your lecture. Okay? Okay. Muy bien. Entonces, es todo por hoy. Es todo por hoy, estudiantes. See you in another time. Hasta luego. Hasta pronto. Chao. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. Feliz Navidad. Eh, eh.
Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Okay, students, that's all for today's lesson. If you have any questions, send them to the Ministry of Education and the Television Jamaica social media pages. I'm Kevin Edwards. I am Yasmin Novas Garrix. Up next is Cape Physics. Adios! Adios. <laughs>
Hello, we're back with more in Cape Physics. We'll be continuing our journey today looking at the PN junction diode. I'm Paul Bender. Okay, when we, when we speak about junction diodes, uh, they are such a very important part of many of the electronic devices that we use and so on, all right? And associated with any junction di diode are some terms that we will explore and we will also explore how the junction diode functions and then we we'll look at a couple of uses for the junction diode. All right, so at the end of this presentation, you should be able to distinguish between a semiconductor and a conductor. You're supposed to be ex able to explain the terms intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. You ought, to, um, you ought to be able to explain the formation of what is called a depletion layer at a PN junction. I'm losing it. Ex um, use the terms reverse bias and forward bias. Interpret the IV graph of a PN junction diode. Those are what we'll be able to. And also explain the role of a PN junction diode in AC rectification. That's one of the uses. Might seem like a bit much, but we'll, we'll be able to get through it today. All right, so first of all, we want to semiconductor. The word semi suggests half, half conductor. Or semi suggests part conductor. So when we talk of a semiconductor, we're, not, we're talking of a material that is not um, a full conductor, and it has some properties that differ from conducting materials. So let's look at some of these, these differences here. We have a conductor and a semiconductor. Conductor has a, has a, conductors have a large number of free electrons, which wherein semiconductors have a low number of free electrons. Conductors generally are metals, and metals have a, a, a lattice structure in which there are free electrons or a sea of electrons which are available for conduction, whereas semiconductors tend to come from group four or the metalloids within the the, the periodic table as classification of materials and as such they have what are called covalent bonds and so with covalent bonds the valence electrons are not really free they are all bound up in bonding with other atoms forming the bonds between atoms so the electrons are not really free whereas in a metal there is there are this lattice structure with a sea of electrons that are around the atoms, and these sea of electrons can be easily detached, right? The outer electrons of atoms in conductors can be removed with small potential difference. You apply a small potential difference, and the, the, these electrons can be removed. Outer electrons have to be removed with a relatively large potential difference in semiconductors. And so when... Uh, because of that covalent bond and the strong bonds that they are formed. Materials, conductors are normally materials with low resistivity. The resistivity is a factor that tells you how resistant this material is to the flow of current through it. If a material has a low resistivity, it allows current to flow through it readily. If it has a high resistivity, it it doesn't allow current to flow through it. Insulators have extremely high resistivities. They just don't allow current to flow through them. However, semiconductors have resistivities somewhere between a, a, a conductor and an insulator. So they have um, their resistivities. In conductors will not behave as an insulator at any temperature. No matter what temperature you put a semi a insul, a conductor, it does not change its conducting properties. 
what happens is when you carry a conductor to near the absolute zero, then it becomes a superconductor and it has zero resistance, right? Um, pure semiconductors behave as insulators as at the absolute zero of temperature. So the reverse happens. If you carry a semiconductor to a temperature near the absolute zero of temperature, it will behave as an insulator. So this is a critical difference between conductors and, and insulators here. Now, if you mix conductors with impurities, it causes an increase in the resistivity. So conductors, if you put impurities, if, for instance, you have a pure, a pure material, say aluminum, and you put another metal and you make a, a, a um, and you make an alloy, that all alloy will not have the same con resistivity. It will have a higher resistivity than the pure aluminum itself. However, on the other side, mixing semiconductors with impurities can cause a decrease in the resistivity. That means that the semiconductor will become more conducting and become a better conductor. And this property of semiconductors we will look at that is used in, deter in making semiconductors a little bit more conduct um, conducting so that you can use them for all the processes that you can use them for. Some examples of, of conductors, silver, copper, aluminum are conductors. And um, some examples of semiconductors, sil silicon, germanium, and gallium. These are found in, in the group four of the periodic table. For those of you who are familiar with the periodic table in group four, and they all belong to the classification of materials called metalloids. And so they are, that's where they are found. That is in the same group with carbon. And so they are, they are tetravalent. They have four outer electrons. Group four, remember in the groups, it tells you how many electrons, how many valence electrons they are. And in the period, it tells you how many orbits. But in, so all of these are group four elements. OK. We look at what are called intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. Those are just terms. Remember, we said that if you, if you have a pure, a pure semiconductor, say silicon, without any impurities, Without any impurities, we call that an intrinsic semiconductor. So this, an intrinsic semiconductor, they have one type of atom throughout. If you were to go to any part of an intrinsic, sem a sample of in intrinsic semiconductor, you will find the same atoms. However, if you put impurities, and we will see that the impurities is not like just pouring dirty something on something. It is about adding atoms that are not the same as the intrinsic. If you put atoms which are of a different element, we call those impurities. And so extrinsic sem semiconductors have impurities within them. And so we will look at how, how extrinsic semiconductors are formed from intrinsic semiconductors. And remember, Bear in mind that what it said is that if you put impurities in semiconductor materials, you decrease, you decrease the resistivity, and as such, these semiconductors will become more conducting. They'll be able to be, become better conductors. And so the whole, the whole process of putting impurities into intrinsic semiconductors, a, a method called doping, is a very, very important part of all of the whole electronics enterprise as um, there are, they are hundreds of companies and so on that are just dedicated to doing this, this kind of, of things. All right. All right. So here we have an N-type intrinsic semiconductor. This is silicon. This is silicon. And silicon has this kind of a square lattice structure. 
quite different from carbon, which has a tetrahedral structure. It is cubical in nature, but this is just one dimension. And these are the, the valence electrons. Each silicon has four valence electrons. But you remember in, the out, in that shell, in that outermost shell, it can accommodate up to eight electrons. And so they form the covalent bonds. And so they, when they share the electrons, each one completes the shell with its eight electrons. And so we have that kind of a lattice structure. And so this is an intrinsic, intrinsic semiconductor as it is, because it has one type of atom. Now, if we were to take, say, if we were to take phosphorus, phosphorus is a group, five element. Phosphorus will have five valence electrons, five valence electrons. And if we were to take that phosphorus and we were to replace a silicon atom with that phosphorus atom, then this is what will happen. So we're going to replace this silicon with the phosphorus. We're going to replace this silicon with the phosphorus. What happens is that, the, it, remember this is, this is pentavalent. It has five orbital electrons. And so four of those electrons will form bonds with four of the silicons around it. And there will be an, a, an unattached electron. All right? So these four here, they would form the bonds. And then we have an unattached electron here. These ones are unattached. And those electrons become available for conduction. So what we have done, we have made this intrinsic semiconductor an extrinsic semiconductor with two available or, well, at least in this particular thing, with available electrons which become available for conduction. And if you have more electrons available for conduction, you have reduced the resistivity of the material. And so we call this an n-type because we have two negative particles that are available, n negative type extrinsic semiconductor. All right, so if you take a one from a group high up, we use phosphorus. All right. Then we can look at p-type. Again, we have our intrinsic. And then we, if we take an aluminum, say an aluminum atom. Aluminum comes from the group 3. So this is trivalent, and it has three valence electrons. Now, if you were to replace a silicon with that aluminum, if you were to replace the silicon with the aluminum, we replace these two with an aluminum. These three will form bonds with the, with the thing, but then it only has three. Then we will have two vacant spaces or two vacant states, right? Two vacant states here, which in the theory we call them holes. We call them holes because these are vacant. There are no electrons. There are no electrons in that in those those two states there. All right, they are they are called holes. Okay, let me just make sure that I have. I don't want the. All right, so these holes here and these other electrons have formed the bonds, and so we have holes. Now, those are just vacant states, and they are considered to be positive electrons. Right? They are considered to be positive electrons. And so here we have our P-type, positive type extrinsic semiconductor. Now, these positive electrons are also available for conduction. Now, there's a theory they call the energy gap theory and so on. We wouldn't get into that, but it, that, this is also explained in terms of energy gap theory. But suffice it to say that when you do n-type doping, they call it doping, or when you make an intrinsic semiconductor into an extrinsic semiconductor by using um, n-type doping, you, you get available electrons. When you use p-type doping, you get available positive electrons, otherwise called holes, all right, or vice versa. So this, this is your p-type.
So now, what is this thing about a PN junction? A PN junction suggests bringing P-type and N-type materials together at, a, at some junction. So let's see what a PN junction is. A PN junction is an interface or boundary between two semiconductor material types, namely the P-type and the N-type inside a semiconductor. Now, in theory, what we do, we just bring two, two pieces of um, P-type and N-type. And theoretically, we say how, what would happen. But when this is done practically, you have one piece of semiconductor material and it, they are selectively doped together. And so what, hap what happens when you bring these two materials together? So let's see. So we look at the depletion layer, and this is where the theory of the depletion layer comes into being. Now we have two, a P-type. This is a P-type material. This is an N-type. The N-type, the P-type is the holes. N-type is the electrons. All right? So we, so we bring these two together. Now when we bring these two materials together, you remember there are negative elect there are, these are electrons that are available for conduction, and these are holes waiting to be filled because they are vacant spaces. And if there are electrons around, the electrons will go and fill those spaces. And so what begins to happen? When, that, when, this, when, when this happens, then we have our P and our N there. What begins to happen is that electrons begin to go across. They begin to go across. But when they leave their places, they leave holes where they are, right? And once these electrons go across, what becomes here? Here becomes positively charged, and here becomes negatively charged, close to the junction. And once we have positive and negative charges, then an electric field develops. Because we have positive charge and negative charge, an electric field develops across the junction. As this process continues, the electric field grows. And so the electric field grows. And as the electric field grows, you will see, you will see that this electric field will start to prevent electrons from going across the barrier, the junction. Because the electric field will repel the electrons this way. And it will also prevent the holes from going across the barrier because the electric field wants to propel the holes back that way. So after a while, the electric field becomes strong enough to stop the movement or the diffusion of electrons and holes across the junction. And that layer now remains that way. And so what we get is what is called a depletion layer. If you notice the amount of electrons, the electron density outside of the depletion layer and the whole density outside of the depletion layer is greater than in the depletion layer. Okay, so in the depletion layer, we have a, a, a sparser hole and electron density than we have on the outside. And that is why they use the word depletion. The amount of electrons and holes within that layer are depleted. They are lessened. All right? And so... This electric field, it is what it is that keeps these electrons. What happens, right, in actual fact, is that some of these electrons are still able to go against the field and they, 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 they diffuse across the, as well, right? They drift across, all right? But they are very small amount. And so what happens when there is a stability, there is a continuous diffusion and drift that is happening, okay? All right, and so that is our depletion layer. So the depletion layer is this layer that comes about when you bring the P and N junctions together, and when you bring them together, because the electrons are going to fill the holes, they diffuse across the junction, and the hole, when they leave their position, they leave a hole. So after a while, we get holes accumulating on the N side, and electrons accumulating on the P side close to the junction, but after a while that flow, that diffusion stops because of an electric field 
which continuously builds up there. Okay, so that is, that is our depletion layer. Now, we use these PN junctions, and we call them PN junction diodes. You make diodes out of these PN junctions. We use them in electronic circuits. Okay, and so we want to look at the theory on how they function in electronic circuits. And so we can do two types of biases. We, do, we call it biasing the electronic the, the, PN, the junction diode. And biasing is just put a, putting a voltage across it, a potential difference across the diode. Um, but, you know, the, we call it biasing. And so we can forward bias and we can reverse bias. So we will start with reverse bias. How are we going to reverse bias a PN junction? So we already have an internal electric field, as we saw, right? This electric field is existing. Now, if in a reverse bias, what we do, we apply a potential difference, a positive end of the potential difference to the N side and the negative to the P side. And when that happens, there is an external electric field, right? An external electric field appears because once we have a potential difference out there, we will have an electric field. So an external electric field applies. But if you notice, these two electric fields, which are vector quantities, are in the same direction. And so what happens is that we get a large electric field. And this large electric field causes more diffusion to take place until such time that, again, the electric field becomes strong enough to stop the diffusion once again. Okay, and so that large electric field will cause the depletion layer to widen. And so what happens? Nothing flows. If you increase the potential difference, all you do is to increase the depletion layer and it prevents currents from flowing. So when a, when a diode is in reverse bias, it does not allow current to flow through it. But whereas if we have in a forward bias, in a forward bias, we add a positive to this side and a negative to the N side. We attach a negative pole to the N side and a positive pole to the P side. That will send an external field this way. These are vectors. When we add them, the resultant field, the resultant field, these, the resultant of these two fields will cause the depletion layer to disappear because, and then we will have a field that will be able to drive these electrons across from the, the end side. And so what happens is that these electrons are driven, and what we see is that as the electrons drive and come out this side, the holes tend to be drifting towards this side as the electrons leave here. So we have a drift of electrons this way, and we have a drift of holes that way, all right? And so within the junction, within the, the diode, the current that flows is as a result of the movement of both holes and electrons, different from a conductor in which only electrons move within conductors. In semiconductors, and this is an essential difference as well, in semiconductors, the the current consists of movement of both holes and electrons, or, or, right? both positive and negative electrons. And so that's, that's what, that what happens. So if we can just recap this briefly. So when we, when we have our external field, the, the sum of those two fields causes the depletion layer to disappear. And when the defle depletion layer disappears, and it, everything begins to drift down. As these electrons drift down, the holes tend to seem to be drifting backwards. So the holes are going this way, and electrons are going that way. And they complete a circuit and keep coming around like that. All right? So, OK. Now, what is, what is going to happen here? Now, 
what would happen if the external field is less? The potential difference that is producing that external electric field causes an external electric field which is less than the internal electric field. That would be represented by a shorter arrow. What will happen? What will happen? Nothing will happen because there will still be a resultant internal field which will stop the flow of current. So there is a, a particular potential difference below which a PN junction diode will not be conducting. And if that potential difference does not cause an external field that is greater than the internal field, then there will be no conduction. So that there is a kind of a they call it a cut-in, a cut-in voltage. This voltage is, is a voltage, a minimal voltage that is required to make the PN junction diode function, to make it function. It will, not, it will not allow a current to flow in the reverse bias, but it would not allow a current to flow in the forward bias either if the voltage is less than the cutting voltage. And if the volt, because if the voltage is less than the cutting voltage, the external field is smaller than the internal field and the voltage will not be able to overcome what is called that potential barrier. You will not, so you, when you sum the two fields, you will still get a resultant field going this way, which will prevent the the junction diode from conducting. And so this graph here is the um, IV characteristics of a junction diode. I hope you can see it clearly. This is in the forward bias in the conduction. And if you notice in this part here, from here to here, there is no, cur no current is flowing. Current is zero. At some point, probably around point 0.5, because for silicon, and this is a typical silicon, silicon, the cutting voltage is about 0.5 volts. If you have anything less than 0.5 volts for a silicon PN junction diode, it's just not going to function, whether in forward or reverse bias. Okay? And so the cutting voltage is about 0.5 volts. Okay? And then after that 0.5 volts, this is what they, it begins to conduct. And here, in the reverse bias, you can go back as far, very, very far back. And what happens is when you Im keep Im increasing the voltage, just like insulators, after a while, the semiconductor, it will break down. It will lose its, that resistive property. Its, its resistivity will just become zero. Same thing happens to insulators. When you have insulators and you apply a high enough current, even air, which is a good insulator, dry air, if you apply a high enough current, the air breaks down, and that is why you see sparks jumping between um, high voltage to high voltage terminals, because the air loses its insulating properties and it is able to conduct those sparks. And so if you carry this far enough, this will begin to conduct a current. And if you know it, it is a, it's dramatic, right? So this is in the forward bias, reverse bias, cutting, cutting, temp, cutting voltage. Okay. Let's look at two discussion questions before we, we close. N-type extrinsic semiconductors have one unattached electron per atom. So the question is, how is it that a sample of n times n type semiconductor is not negatively charged? We saw that four of the four of the phosphorus electrons will form covalent bonds with four of the uh, of the surrounding silicon electrons, valence electrons, and there is one electron free. So that means that there's one electron free. And so how come it is that if you take a sample of n-type semiconductor material, it is not negatively charged? We saw that there is one. Now, here is the reason. 
you take a neutral phosphorus atoms which have the amount of protons in the nucleus to electri elec electrically balance the number of electrons in the nucleus. So that extra electron, extra in inverted commas that is out there, it's not an electron without a balancing proton because that electron is associated with the phosphorus atoms which have the, elect the number of electrons to balance how many of the electrons it has. Okay, and so that one electron is, doesn't contribute to the negativity of, the, of the, um, the, the, the sample. That one electron is balanced out by a proton in the nucleus of the phosphorus atom. So, and the same thing for the p-type. The p-type would not be positive because there, there, is, there are no, no protons. There are no more protons for that vacant space, just the same am amount of protons because it's neutral atoms you are using to, to use the doping. And then this is another question. A PN junction allows current to flow in one direction only. What will occur when a PN junction diode is placed in a circuit with a lamp and an AC source. So if quickly, if we have a lamp and we have a junction diode here, that's a symbol for a junction diode and we have an AC source. Remember what we said in the last, in the last lesson that an AC current changes direction periodically. So for one period of time it's going this way and so the, the diode will be conducting when it's going this way, the lamp will light. When the current reverses, remember the diode will be now in reverse bias, there will be no current, the lamp will go out. And so the lamp will light, go out, light, go out. And so we can, uh, as the current changes direction, the lamp will light and go out because the diode will go from forward bias to reverse bias as the current changes direction, okay? And so that's all for today. Um, remember, we have been discussing PN junction diode in Cape physics. You can catch a repeat of all today's lessons on JNN starting at 4 p.m. Highlights of the week's programs are also on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m., and on video on demand on one spot media. We also have two channels to help with additional lessons devoted to students of all ages on one spot media, school time and school time maths. We want to hear your comments on this season of Schools Not Out. So send them in. Keep safe, wash your hands regularly, sanitize and wear your mask. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.